All right, um, I will get started with introductions as people continue to join us. So thank you all for coming to this February micro talk and thank you to those of you who were able to come to our, um, our TMC microbe symposium earlier this month. I think that that was, went great. And so today we have two fantastic speakers talking to us about synthetic biology. First up is Dr. Jeff Tabor, who is an associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Biosciences at Rice University. Um, and so Jeff Tabor did both his BA and PhD at, the, at UT Austin. Um, before doing a postdoctoral fellowship at um, UC, UCSF. Um, and Dr. Tabor has um, many active collaborations with people both at TMC and elsewhere, including um, a recent collaboration with my lab. I'm in the lab of Dr. Meng Wong. Um, and um, and he recently founded a company called Panabio. So um, today, Dr. Taylor is going to tell us about engineering bacterial two component systems for discovery and medical applications. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Patricia, for the invitation and the introduction. So here we go. And feel free to tell me if I'm going too long. Uh, I don't think I will, but. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so yeah, my lab, as Patricia mentioned, studies synthetic biology. And so this is sort of our big picture view. We sort of see evolved cells um, functioning a bit like robots, right? The, so having sort of sensors that detect information in the environment, having genetic circuits that process that information, and then um, ultimately controlling the activity of actuators like enzymes or pathways that allow the cell to change its environment or change its state. Um, we'd like to sort of build on that uh, foundation in order to, to engineer with cells, to turn them into engineered artifacts that carry out um, new applications, right? Or new functions and have applications in, in different areas of society like medicine, science, biotechnology, agriculture, the environment and so on. And I think what's really important about synthetic biology is that this arrow of design, um, this often fails, right? Because we think we know what we're doing, but we don't uh, in most cases. And so often um, when we try to design something and it doesn't work, um, that can lead us to a process of discovery, um, discovering elements of biology that we didn't um, actually think to, <coughs> to, to inquire about before this process. And then that discovery can feed back and help us to design better. Right? So uh, there's sort of a virtuous cycle between engineering and science uh, in synthetic biology. <clears throat> so my life's been focused on a particular um, family of sensors, um, bacterial two component systems. Um, <clears throat> and the way that these pathways work is typically you have a transmembrane sensor kinase protein. Um, it has an extracellular sensor domain and an intracellular kinase domain. And in the presence of some input, like a ligand, um, the sensor domain will, act, will um, change its conformation and change the conformation of the kinase domain, causing it to phosphorylate itself and then transfer that phosphoryl group to an intracellular protein called a response regulator. Um, when phosphorylated, that response regulator uh, then binds to a piece of DNA, uh, in many cases, uh, activating or repressing transcription. So in this way, bacteria can sense the external environment and respond by changing gene expression accordingly. Another cool thing about these pathways is when the input goes away, um, many kinases perform the reverse chemistry and dephosphorylate the response regulator and shut off the pathway. So we, we've been particularly interested in these things for a number of reasons, one of which is that they sense a lot of stuff. So they sense basically anything from metal ions um, to, to small molecules, macromolecules, uh, membrane stress, light, um, and a wide range of other things. So uh, the sensor domains are remarkably evolutionarily diversified. 
Um, they're also important in microbiology because uh, they control a lot of important bacterial behaviors like antibiotic resistance, virulence, macrophage survival, respiration, and so on. <clears throat> um, so they're the largest family of signal transduction pathways in biology, and the vast majority of them are completely uncharacterized, meaning we don't know the input and we don't know the output. <clears throat> Nonetheless, um, we know enough about them to start working with them and start making use of them. So typically what we'll do is we'll find a two component system in a bacterial genome. Um, typically the two genes sit next to each other and sometimes uh, or, or, or a fair amount of time, uh, the output promoter or target promoter will sit next to the two component system gene cluster as well. And so what we'll do is uh, what we call refactor these pathways. So we'll sort of rip apart the native DNA. We'll take out the kinase gene. Uh, we'll put it under a synthetic promoter of different strength or synthetic ribosome binding site of different strength. Um, we'll rip apart the response regulator gene and put it under a synthetic promoter of, uh, of various strengths and so on. Uh, and then usually couple promoter or target promoter to a reporter gene. Um, and just ask the question, can we get this pathway working, you know, kind of under our control, as it were? Um, and, you know, what does the response look like? And we often see this characteristic uh, profile where, you know, if uh, there's a sweet spot uh, of the expression level of these two proteins, that sort of, they both need to be in range uh, for the system to respond. Um, and I don't have, don't have time to delve into this, but it's pretty fairly interesting and tells us a little bit about signal transduction and, and the behavior of these proteins. Nonetheless, we can do it uh, oftentimes, and we can move these two component systems around. So one thing my lab is focused on is optogenetics, um, taking light sensing two component systems from cyanobacteria and putting them in E. coli or Bacillus subtilis, uh, reconstituting their function um, and, and optimizing their function. And so over the years, uh, we've, built light sensors that sense ultraviolet, green, red, and near infrared light um, and optimize their, their performance in these, in these model organisms. Um, we've done some applications uh, with these optogenetic tools. So long ago, we sort of showed that you can get spatial control of basically a bacterial uh, biofilm. Um, uh, not a biofilm, but a, a synthetic film of bacteria, uh, spatial control of gene expression across that film with light, um, use that to control multicellular pattern circuit. Uh, we focus a lot on temporal control, so light can be switched on and off or its intensity can be tuned in time. And so we could use that along with a rigorous understanding of, of the dynamics of these systems to actually program artificial gene expression signals inside of live bacteria. I and mean, most recently with uh, Meng Wang, we actually um, uh, use light to control gut bacterial metabolism in the intestine of live C. elegans worms. And actually use that to, um, to study a pathway she discovered where an exopolysaccharide, clonic acid, increases the lifespan of worms by uh, modulating mitochondrial function. Um, my lab's also been interested in using these two component systems as sensors for biomedical applications. So um, uh, in particular, engineering diagnostic gut bacteria has been a, a first space that we've gone into. So a couple of years ago, we found um, uh, the first known biosensor of the molecule thiosulfate, which is an oxidized form of sulfur that occurs in the gut during inflammation. Um, and we engineered probiotic strain of E. coli to sense thiosulfate and produce GFP in response. And we then administered uh, those bacteria into the stomach of healthy mice and inflamed mice, collected the fecal samples, and used flow cytometry to, to see activation, specific activation of our thiosulfate sensor in mice um, that were inflamed. Um, so this showed, you know, despite all the complexities of the in vivo environment, we could we can use um, an engineered signal transduction pathway to detect uh, physiological state uh, in vivo. So this is quite promising early result and encouraged us to do more uh, in this space. Um, and so we're looking for more sensors and more pathways to study. Um, and uh, and we want to harness a lot of what nature has given us in terms of these two component systems. It's given us tens of thousands. Um, the problem is, um, for the vast majority of them, you can find them in a genome by sequence homology, but you don't know the input and you don't know the target promoter that they activate, right? So uh, the system is very difficult to study uh, with two unknowns like that. 
Most bacteria can't be grown in the lab or genetically manipulated. Um, oftentimes you try to port the systems into say a convenient host like E. coli and there's some kind of silencing or incompatibility uh, between the, um, the promoter of interest, for example, and the RNA polymerase. These can take a long time to figure out what's going wrong. And there's also a lot of crosstalk. A lot of these uh, two component system promoters get cross repressed or cross activated by pathways you don't uh, know a priori um, and so on. And this can cause a lot, of, a lot of issues as well. And so we had an idea a few years back to sort of eliminate all those problems or tr try to eliminate all those problems. Um, the idea was basically to take a two component system from nature and just cut off its DNA binding domain uh, from the response regulator and replace it with a well-known, well-characterized DNA binding domain that activated a, um, an optimized target promoter, right? So that way you could eliminate the unknown output of a two-component system by giving it a known output. Uh, and there, then you're just generally left with an unknown input, right? And then you could potentially do screens to figure out what this thing sends. Right? <clears throat> um, this would also get rid of a lot of the problems of cross-regulation and so on. So I had a great uh, postdoc, Sebastian Schmidl, now at Texas A&M, and Felix Eknes, who's a grad student in the lab, uh, who uh, did great work on, uh, on making this happen. And so uh, here's an example where we just started with our red light sensing two-component system, and we made a chimera with our green light sensing DNA binding domain. And we made, I think we made about 30 or 40 chimeras um, sort of flanking the linker region. So we aligned the two response regulators and just switch, moved the, the fusion site around. And what we saw was really cool. Um, we got about 10 or so chimeric proteins that worked. They could be phosphorylated and activated by phosphorylation. Um, and we saw an optimum. So if you just look at the white bars or the fold response to light, um, you know, there was sort of an optimum right on the C-terminal side of the linker in this case, but you know, uh, other amino acids around that area worked as well, worked well too. And this spoke to the modular nature of these proteins. We think um, basically the fact that they undergo phosphorylation induced dimerization, um, if you put sort of any kind of cargo that can be activated by dimerization on this dimerization domain, uh, you could potentially activate it, right? And you don't need some type of intricate allosteric communication between the phosphorylation domain and the, and the DNA binding domain, for example. So we went on in this paper to show this is quite general. In fact, it works with multiple response regulator subfamilies. Uh, we can swap multiple domains onto multiple phosphorylation domains at conserved sites uh, or optimal sites that we identified. It works quite well. And so um, we've been using this to try to get at these systems better. Um, and so one thing we wanted to do is use it to port two component systems between evolutionarily distant organisms, right? And so here's an example where we ported an E. coli uh, two-component system into Bacillus subtilis. Now, this is a nitrate activated system and it doesn't work. So um, basically the output promoter is off all the time, regardless of nitrate. And you might think, well, that's because the membranes are biochemically different and maybe this is incompatible. And that's what we thought too at first, but then we just swapped the DNA binding domain uh, from the E. coli DNA binding domain and target promoter to the subtlest, to a subtlest DNA binding domain and target promoter. And it res completely restored the activity of this system. It's 2000 fold activated in Bacillus subtilis. And so it turns out it was just an incompatibility between the E. coli promoter and the subtlest polymerase, right? Uh, and, and that the swapping fixes it, right? And so this enabled us to port this between these very distant organisms, this technology. Um, sort of the biggest application is discovering inputs, right? And we want to use the technology to discover inputs at a scale that hadn't been possible before. And so uh, Catherine Brink, a great grad student in the lab, uh, spearheaded this effort to use the technology to do this. So she went to uh, the genome of Schuonella onodensis, which is an environmental uh, microbe, lives in fresh water. Um, and it's sort of famous for breathing a lot of alternative electron acceptors in the absence of oxygen, right? Like um, crazy metals and things that we could screen against as possible activators of its two-component system. So we, we went into its genome, we found eight two-component systems of the ompar phobi family that were totally uncharacterized. Uh, we don't know what they sense. And we just expressed them all in E. coli and rewired them all to um, a synthetic DNA binding domain in a reporter protein. 
And we screened all of them against about 100 chemicals. And we had sort of just selected these chemicals to include those metals and then other things that two component systems might sense. Um, and long story short, we found that one of these two component systems is an acid activated uh, sensor. So um, uh, about pH seven it, or below pH seven, it turns on uh, gene expression. Um, and it's sort of activity is proportional to the pH in that, in that range. Um, and that hadn't been known before. Uh, the system's conserved in some pathogens like Yersinia pestis, and presumably sensing pH there, and we don't know why, but we were able to discover that that's what this particular system uh, does, or it's at least one function of this system. Um, interestingly, this guy, Sean Colgan at Colorado, uh, emailed me right after we published that paper and said, um, that's exactly a system that we need. We're studying this process of extracellular acidosis um, in mammalian hosts during Crohn's disease. So basically inflammation in the intestine during Crohn's uh, results in the accumulation of lactic acid and that can drop the pH to about three. Uh, and he wanted to study that in vivo uh, with an engineered gut bacterium. So we took our pH sensor, our acidic pH sensor linked it to GFP and Sean put these bacteria in healthy mice and genetically inflamed mice. Uh, and we saw the more inflamed they were, the more acidified their intestinal lumen was, and the more our um, reporter E. coli turned on. So this is a nice second example of being able to engineer a diagnostic uh, gut bacterium. And again, this two component system had come from this environmental microbe just a couple of years before, and it's what it sensed was completely unknown. So let me check the time quickly. Okay, I'm probably wrapping up here. So all, all I wanna say here is that we're scaling this, this approach up, right? So we're an engineering lab. Uh, we wanna uh, use a technology we've developed uh, to make a lot of discoveries of two component systems and then use them uh, for diagnostic and therapeutic applications. So we started by going into the human microbiome genomes from human gut bacteria, for example, um, in doing uh, sort of classifying the two component systems and finding the ones that we could rewire using our rewiring method. Um, we've got a library of about 550 of these things that are totally uncharacterized. Um, we, we've commercially synthesized the pathways, the genes uh, for the pathways, and we're now doing screens against uh, ligands of interest from the gut environment. So stress-linked ligands and ligands associated with inflammation, injury, and other, and other issues. And um, that work is ongoing, um, but one of the early results we is a, a two-component system that senses the molecule substance P. And this is kind of an interesting molecule. It's an 11 amino acid peptide um, that's linked to pain perception. It's a neuropeptide. Uh, it's been known for almost 100 years, and it's known to be sensed by human G-protein coupled receptor. Um, but bacteria weren't known to sense it before. And so we found a two component system uh, in, this human, in the human gut microbiome um, that is specifically activated by substance P. Um, we're fleshing out uh, the details now and, and learning more about that this is real and that, that it's specific activation. And so uh, this is kind of cool. Um, and uh, one immediate application is, is that substance P is produced in the intestine during inflammatory bowel disease. So this could be a sensor for that potentially. Uh, <clears throat> we're also uh, looking at um, complex human fecal samples. So we're collecting samples from healthy patients and sick patients, screening them against our library to try to find two component systems that turn on when, when you're sick. Um, and then be able to back out the mechanism of what, what they're binding, what's activating them. Uh, but even if we don't, uh, these could potentially be sensors of, of human inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. Um, I don't want to go too much over time. I'll just say we have a cool technology with the biomaterials lab in my department to encapsulate our engineered bacteria inside of alginate hydrogel. So you base alginates a biomaterial from seaweed, right, polymer. Um, and we can make a soft core with the bacteria inside of it and then a, 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 a firm shell that uh, across which particles can diffuse, but not bacteria. And we can use those bacteria to sense in vivo signals. Um, and, and these little particles are cool because they increase bacterial viability during transit through the animal. And they can also be permanently large or lodged for uh, long periods of time on the tissue uh, using uh, delivery devices. Um, and so they could potentially enable us to do long-term monitoring 
in treatment of uh, intestinal link diseases. And so uh, we just have data showing uh, the bacteria survive well and, and they can sense um, inflammation in vivo with, with this system. Okay, so um, yeah, I went over a little bit, apologize for that, um, but thanks for listening. And um, I'll take questions maybe at the, at the very end, is that how we do it? Um, typically we would do questions right now. Um, okay. yeah. We certainly have time, so yes, thank you. Um, does anybody have questions for Dr. Tabor? I, this is Heidi. I have a question. Should I let a student talk? Well, can I ask mine quickly and then let a student go? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So my question has to do with the, um, the reporters. It's, it's really cool stuff, Jeff, by the way. And of course, you know that. Uh, but I'm curious, um, in terms of the reporters, like you were using GFP, and um, but I'm wondering, you know, um, if that and, and you, I guess you could have a detector in a in a fecal sample um, for light for you know production. But I'm just sort of wondering, is there a concern about um, if you are collecting feces, whether or not that environment would be different than what the gut was, and that your genes wouldn't be turned on again in that, um, you know, in that shift of environment. That's a fantastic question. And so we actually, I didn't share the data, but we also sacrificed the animals and collected the bacteria from the different intestinal tissues and then measured GFP levels across the intestine and basically see in this particular uh, DSS model of, of colon inflammation, we see that um, the bacteria in the colon, in particular, the, like di the distal colon, are strongly activated and they basically look exactly like the ones in the fecal samples. And the ones in the small intestine aren't, don't get activated yet and so on. Um, in our pH sensor work, Sean Colgan, our collaborator showed that it's actually the ileum, uh, the small end of the small intestine where um, that sensor gets turned on in the animals using a similar approach. And so, yeah, that's something that we're really interested in and, and looking at carefully to, to try to understand more about the heterogeneity in, in vivo and, and like the dynamics of where these things are turning on. Yeah, yeah, but I'm also, and I'm also thinking though, um, um, like in terms of um, the GFP that gets produced, for instance, like, like you, it seems like you might even wanna make um, a secondary reaction or something so like you're making a product and you want to make sure like you want to make sure that you can detect the product yeah. that's been made in the gut let's say still in the i'm just concerned that you're going to lose the activity in the feces because the environment's going to be different but that's that, all, you know sorry sorry i misunderstood it. and that's a, another fantastic point point. and so uh, that is absolutely possible uh, you could get gfp production in vivo and cell growth you know gfp stable but cell growth um, could cause it to to reduce uh, in, in each of the the progeny cells that we measure at the end for example yeah and so yeah there's a couple strategies that uh, we've been looking at for a while to, to overcome that so um First, uh, the one I'm most excited about is acoustic re reporter genes. So um, there's sort of a new <laughs> technology where ba bacterial gas vesicles, uh, which exclude water and concentrate gas uh, that these uh, environmental bacteria use to like float to yeah, the surface yeah. of water. Mm -hmm. uh, Mikhail Shapiro's lab at Caltech has sort of repurposed these as reporter genes um, because they have acoustic properties where they can be specifically detected, uh, detected with ultrasound. Oh. Uh, from outside the body. And so he's shown that you can detect them in bacteria in the gut of a mouse uh, with ultrasound imaging. And so, uh, yeah, we've been working with him to, to replace GFP with those yeah. for sort of the non-invasive <laughs> in vivo imaging. Mm -hmm. um, and we also think that approach will be useful if we want to implant these bacteria like long-term sort of uh, suture them to the intestinal wall, for example, inside of one of these alginate carriers and leave them there for like a month or two and you wanna see flares, caught, you know, flare ups over time causing activation. We think imaging from outside the body with ultrasound could be a really nice way for that. 
The other thing I'll add is that people have used genetic memory devices. So, so instead of GFP, we could activate like a recombinase, which could flip yeah. a piece of mm -hmm. DNA, yeah. which could turn on a promoter, which could yeah. turn on GFP forever, right? Yeah. And so other, other groups have published uh, approaches like that. And even yeah. so, you know, in principle, we could connect to those kind of systems too. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, okay. I mean that solving that problem in some way. So thank you. That was perfect. That was great. Wonderful stuff. Cool. Thanks. Really, really cool. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I'll take a question from uh, Kevin, who's a student at Baylor. Kevin is asking, can we design a circuit for sensing intracellular signaling in bacteria? For example, if bacteria produce some toxins in a specific environment, can we make a circuit to report toxin production status? Yeah, that's a great question. I think so. I mean, I think one of the major classes of stimuli that these two component systems sense, for example, is bacterial warfare agents, right? Uh, bacteriocins um, and so on. They wanna know when they're being attacked by the immune system or by another, another bacterium. And so uh, I think the answer is uh, yes. Uh, you know, the details would matter here. You know, what toxin do you want to sense? And is there a sensor available or could you find one? Um, but yeah, generally speaking, yes. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a two component system either. We, we think two component systems are really cool and there's a lot to discover there, but there's also other types of bacterial sensor pathways, you know, um, membrane sensors linked to sigma factor release um, you know, one component systems, which are inside the cytoplasm and they detect things inside the cytoplasm uh, primarily. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of possibilities. Uh, if you have a target molecule in mind that you wanna sense, um, uh, there's generally a number of ways to, to, to start thinking about how to sense it. Um, and Patrick, did you have a question? Yeah, hi. Um... That's really all cool stuff. Um, what are the, uh, you, you showed some kind of response, uh, you know, dose response concentration ranges, but like, how do these vary? Like for, for different types of compounds or, I mean, you go from tiny, tiny um, like thiosulfate to this 11 peptide, like what's the range of sizes of molecules and also concentration ranges, I guess is one question. And then, you know, if, when you're doing this like screening, are you expecting that you're going to find um, res response or, or sensor domains that have a naturally evolved response to, to the thing of interest, or just it also has a, a you know a secondary specific? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it because you think that there already are naturally evolved sensors for these things, or just because they might also respond to these things, or is there is are those the same? <laughs> These are both really great questions. So for the first question, you know, what's the concentration range of activation that we see? Uh, so I would say, generally speaking, broad strokes, we see like, you know, micromolar, low micromolar to, I don't know, you know, high micromolar uh, kind of range, yeah. Yeah. Uh, high hundreds of micromolar. Um, uh, we, we did actually show that the phosphatase activity of the sensor kinase, this basically, the kinase is kind of like a push-pull system, right? It, it, the kinase is like a push, pushing the signal. The phosphatase is a pull, pulling it back. We showed that if you specifically reduce that phosphatase activity with mutation, you can actually make the, the whole system respond to like a hundredfold less stimulus. Uh, hmm. So basically allowing the kinase to, to win out more, more easily. Um, and so that's one way you can tune that. Um, uh, without solving the problem of like ligand binding, you know, increasing right. ligand binding. Um, yeah. cool. The other question, uh, and, and does that does that change with like the size of the ligand? Uh, we haven't really looked at that carefully. You haven't seen any obvious signatures that it's like you know more sensitive to bigger things and less sensitive to smaller things. That would be that would be really interesting to look at. Um, and then your, the second question was about. Uh, oh, I guess yeah. just like. It, yeah, if you're making these libraries and screening, is it because you think that there are already like existing by design sensors, or is it just because there's going to be second, you know, moonlighting uh, specificity, you know? Yeah. So we think both are possible, right? And so there's examples of both out there. So some of these systems have exquisite specificity for molecules, right? Like nitrate sensor, NARX comes to comes to mind. Right. You know, it senses nitrate 
really high specificity. It doesn't send similar small molecules of similar charge or similar shape. Uh, it even discriminates against nitrite by like, I don't know, a hundredfold or something like that. It's really specific, right? And it's not really stimulated by, it doesn't moonlight with other things. Then you get two component systems, which are like, like kinases, which are like super generalist. They'll sense like membrane disruption, right? And they have some general mechanism. They're sensing like, you know, depletion of a cation near a membrane or, or you know, uh, integration of an of a, of a antimicrobial peptide in a membrane. And they can sense all sorts of stuff, right? And there's some that seem to sense osmolarity, like super general. And so you, you kind of get both. And what we're hoping to get actually is either, you know, ideally we'd get a super specific sensor of a super specific biomarker, and then we'd be set. But even if we got a generalist sensor of a biomarker of interest, you know, that could be at least a starting point to maybe optimize it by evolution or, you know, yeah design to, to try to make it more specific. So we're just kind of excited to go down the path to begin with, uh, to make some, make some initial headway and see, see where we need to go next. So I see we have at least one more question, but for the sake of making sure that um, Dr. Serino gets his full time, I think that I will move on. And um, if, if you are the, question askers have time to stay on at the end, I'm sure that we can continue the discussion. Um, so next I'm up. I'm fine if, I, 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 isn't there just one more question? We, I mean, we, it looked oh. like there was just, just okay, one sure. more. <laughs> okay. Was it David? Yeah, David. yeah. Uh, I guess real quick. Do the responses all have a typical, uh, a similar, steepness or hill coefficient? Yeah, they, uh, we don't see a lot of variability there. It's always a, a something in the neighborhood of two, <laughs> one and a half to two. Um, and don't ask me why. Uh, we haven't ripped that apart. <laughs> uh, um, and but yeah. The yeah. And they typically have two binding, spot, binding sites in the uh, promoter. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely that is the case. And maybe that's driving that, that number. Okay, cool. Mm, yep. Great, thank you. All right. Next Shall up. Shall I share my screen or? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, oh. I'll just give you a quick introduction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so <laughs> next up, we have Dr. Patrick Serino, who is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Houston. Um, Prior to coming to the University of Houston, Dr. Serino was an associate professor um, for, at, um, sorry, I'm losing my space, uh, was a, yes, an associate professor in chemical engineering at Penn State. Um, Dr. Serino got his bachelor's in chemical engineering at Ohio University, um, his PhD in chemical engineering um, at Caltech, and then did some postdoctoral training at the University of Florida. And today he's going to talk to us about customized microbial transcription factors for molecular reporting and cellular engineering. So take it away. All right. see my presentation screen? Yes, this looks great. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, thanks for um, the, uh, the invitation uh, to present this micro talk and thanks for uh, folks who are uh, listening in. Um, today I'll be discussing my uh, group's work on transcription factor engineering, um, which is in this case, these are, you know, I guess with the theme here, these are uh, one component, one component um, sensors. It, all intracellular inside, inside plasma bacteria is what I'm talking about. We call them endogenous molecular reporters. Um, so the just a brief overview of the work in my lab, our focus is, is biocatalysis. 
Um, so it, that kind of leads to us uh, engineering enzymes and metabolic pathways in microorganisms. Um, and this then naturally leads to work on synthetic gene regulation and ultimately um, transcription factors, um, which we like to use for high throughput uh, biocatalyst screening. And we can call them genetically, and we don't call them, everyone calls them genetically encoded biosensors. Uh, I'm not sure who coined that phrase. But everyone likes to use fancy terminology. Um, okay, so I'll approach um, this talk on the premise that combinatorial biological design is, is, is powerful and effective uh, when, whenever possible. It's a strategy that we in my group um, almost always prefer, uh, again, when possible. And so it, for the case of, uh, say, strain and enzyme engineering to produce uh, chemicals, say, say, metabolic engineering, um, I'll just give it, you know, everyone has a sense of what this is, um, but it involves basically generating genetic diversity uh, just in some way to then screen for um, or, or select for um, mutants or variants that confer improved um, titer or production uh, activity, whatever it is, uh, to, to make a chemical. Um, and then iterating through this process, Rescreening, repeating, um, fine tuning, you know, maybe having to change sensitivity of the screening system as you go, uh, just continuously evolve your um, production or tighter. Um, so, you know, for the case of, of biocatalysis or bio, uh, say metabolic engineering, you know, one challenge is, in, is certainly in figuring out, you know, basically this first step, what kind of genetic diversity. Um, you know, what are the smartest libraries to generate? What are the libraries that are most likely to lead to identification of, of mutants or um, you know, mutations that confer enhanced production, whatever? So that is certainly a challenge, but typically a greater challenge is this is, is part two, which is in the screening, high throughput screening or, or developing genetic selections um, that allow you to then search through these huge, hopefully huge libraries. The goal is to get large libraries, but you're limited by your screening capabilities. Um, so, you know, considering the uh, amazing throughput of, of instruments um, that can sort, you know, like for cell sorters um, that can sort individual um, cells based on their fluorescence, um, and or even um, high throughput nature of, of say colony screens, um, and of course, you know, the power of of using uh, growth based uh, genetic selections um, to enrich for uh, more fit um, mutants fit based on the selection. For all these reasons, it just makes really good sense to find ways to couple the biosynthesis of a target um, metabolite or you know compound that you that you, that you want to produce and some desired bioproduct um, to couple that biosynthesis to the expression of a reporter. Um, gene or a selection gene. Um, hence, we want to repurpose small molecule uh, inducible transcription factors, um, regulatory proteins, things that can activate gene expression uh, or, un or deactivate, you know, repress or activate in the presence or absence of the, the target compound. So that's the big picture here, the kind of the motivation for all the stuff. Um, and in addition to um, the applications in high throughput screening, um, engineered transcription factors could also be implemented as essentially dynamic um, regulators in metabolic engineering, um, much like their, their natural counterparts, which is what transcription factors do. Um, but so you can you know, fine tune the expression levels of genes up and down stream of, of oh, yeah. So if you have intermediates, you know, as they build up to a certain level, then maybe you can activate genes downstream. And then as intermediates go down, those uh, downstream pathways maybe get um, repressed so that you're not potentially um, uh, throttling some type of, of metabolic pathway. Um, so it's a, it's a uh, balancing, you know, dynamic regulation. So there's other applications, I guess, is what I want to say. Uh, okay. So, um, if the aim is to use transcription factor-based uh, sensor slash reporter systems um, for high throughput screening, um, 
for selection, but there is not yet, you know, such an existing transcription factor available, or, you know, a sensor reporter system, then you either have to uh, find one or, or make one. Um, so, you know, there's lots of ways of, of nowadays doing gene mining, and especially if you have an understanding of metabolic pathways that might involve these compounds of interest, I guess this is a lot of kind of similar to what Dr. Uh, Tabor does, you know, that you can go do the discovery. Um, and that's certainly one way of, of, of finding a new transcription factor uh, for your for your purposes. Um, similarly, people do a similar thing here is, is just doing transcriptome analysis, inducing with the, 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 the compound of interest or maybe precursors of the compound um, and, and identifying potentially novel transcription factors that are involved in regulating pathways in the upstream or downstream of, of the, the molecule of interest. But sometimes these molecules are, are even new to nature. Um, and so there, it might not be feasible to expect that there's one existing already. I'm talking about molecules that people are interested in synthesizing um, uh, to large, you know, to maybe high uh, titers for pharmaceutical applications or, or um, renewable uh, as, as platform chemicals um, for chemical industry. Okay, so uh, the way that we go about it, instead of finding them is make them. Um, you know, within reason, we, we choose to just use protein engineering to alter the ligand binding domain or we call the effector binding domain. We call it ligand, effector, in inducer, just to be clear, those are all kind of the same here. The thing that gets bound to, a, in, to affect the gene regulation, whether it's to activate it or, or repress it. Um, so this is another approach. Take a well-known, uh, well-characterized regulatory protein, works in the host that you'd like to work with, or you know you can probably make you know, super high titers of whatever it is you're trying to make um, and go from there. So that's kind of the, the general idea. That's what we do. And, and, and so this, you know, the, my group has largely used, focused on this one protein here, Eritse. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that we have also uh, worked with others, and I'll, I'll talk about one at the end here. Um, but early on, you know, we tested a couple different regulatory proteins that were relatively, you know, well characterized, um, Lysar types, um, a variety. And it, it all kind of came out to ARC was worked well for us uh, in E. coli. We were able to do a lot of, of engineering of its, of its um, you know, ligand response and, and even like the, um, it was well behaved, I'll say that. Okay, so I introduce ARC. I think probably everybody here is aware of uh, at least what PBAD is, uh, the promoter um, that ARC deregulates, uh, and it's induced by l arabinose um, This is an E. coli um, transcription uh, regulator. It's been extensively characterized by Robert Schleif um, from Hopkins. He basically taught us a lot of what we know about bacterial gene regulation. Um, at least in these um, one component um, uh, regulators. So he showed that the Aristide dimer here forms a loop uh, and represses um, expression from the, this promoter in the absence of the inducer, l arabinose and then when it binds l arabinose big conformational change and gene activation. Pretty cool, but that's just what happens in nature. Um, so we want to engineer that. Um, so they, again, th we learned a lot uh, from prior structural and mutagenesis studies from mostly Schleif's group, but others. So there was a lot of information available to us when we sought to use ARFC as a kind of platform to design novel um, molecular recognition. Um, so, you know, we knew some information about where contacts were, you know, whoops, were occurring uh, in, the, in the presence versus absence of ligand and you get this arm shifting and stuff like that. So we had some information. So it gave us, um, you know, um, encouragement that we could probably use some pretty massive binding pocket reconstruction. Um, and so, you know, I guess that's kind of what we sought out to do uh, early on. Um, this is just showing the, you know, the gene expressions. This is just a flow, flow analysis with them without arabinose with a GFP report. So, okay. Uh, so <clears throat> we initially approached our redesign of the binding pocket by making large combinatorial site saturation libraries. Some examples here, if we do four sites or five sites, one, two, three, four, five, we're just doing complete site saturation. So you're accessing all amino acids simultaneously. So you can you know, get the library sizes, they get big, 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 obviously. 
go exponentially. Um, so big libraries, um, and you know, then we have to screen these. You know, we, but we know we can do that with with something like facts um, or even colony screens or selections. Um, so you know, we basically started. We had some some compounds that we wanted um, sensors for because they there were none existing. And then we just said, well, well, let's see what else we can get sensors for. Let's just you know throw everything at it and see what comes out of the out of the screen. Um, so that's you know that that's kind of how things happened over over many years. Um, so this is you know showing. And I'll say this is you know again within reason. We're we're looking for similar molecular architectures, not like drastically different sized compounds to, to induce something that normally is induced by just a rabinose, you know. Um, so, you know, within reason. So this is kind of the library creation slash screening workflow um, that was ultimately, you know, developed and implemented, um, you know, but took, took a while to get to this point. Uh, but this slide, this slide summarizes, you know, that the general approach. Um, you know, we actually pool together often multiple libraries. Sometimes some, some of these are um, random immunogenesis, you know, by error prone PCR or something, or, or one library will target just a certain part of the domain, another library will target another part of the domain, or, you know, so combinations of different types of libraries, saturation um, and random stuff like that. Pool those together. Um, and, you know, if, if we initially clone those for, for sorting, Using something like GFPR RFP, then we can rapidly get rid of the majority of, of of variants which are going to be very leaky, essentially always on, or maybe they are still be inducible, but they're already so leaky they're not going to be very useful for as tools for screening. So we get rid of those, um, and then we proceed. You know, often we'll subclone that what comes out into into a selection um, strain. So, so, and then plate them onto, onto different plates with different, com with different compounds all over the place, compound, 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 and see what comes up. And then iterate through, you know, then maybe doing um, some, some iterative facts sorting. We use decoy compounds to throw, you know, at them so to, to eliminate nonspecific variants. We almost always use l as the as an initial decoy to make sure we're, you know, basically, because um, it just makes sense, I guess, <laughs> that if it doesn't bind to l um, then it's not going to be uh, leaky or non-specific. Um, so you know we, we've iterated through this in, in different ways. This is the general workflow, and you can so l rabinose is, is the native inducer. Um, you can uh, early on we we instead we flipped it to d as the as the inducer. I showed some of the dose responses here. Um, Tricyc acid lactone, which I'll talk about in a bit, but you can see the dose response here. Um, you know, I'm just kind of, it's a micro talk, so I'm, I'm whizzing vanillin, salicylic acid, uh, or salinic acid, I'll talk about for a second at the end as well. Um, all right, so that really summarizes the, the sensor design part. Um, and so now I'll just give some examples of how we use, uh, how we use, you know, or some of the sensors that we made, why we made them, and um, it, it, how we used them for pathway engineering, cellular engineering. Okay. For many years, uh, there's been um, a lot of interest in this compound TAL, triacetic acid lactone, uh, as a potential um, biorenewable platform chemical. Um, it also, it represents a minimal polyketide. So it's like a very minimal type three polyketide synthase. Uh, we'll make this triketide and release TAL. Um, and so there's interest in, in even having tau sensors as sensors for minimal uh, or exp expression of minimal PKS domains um, for, for people that are interested in polyketide synthesis. Um, so it, there's other enzymes that can make um, tau, by the way. But our interest originally was let's see if we can get a sensor for tau, which we got, and then see if we can engineer E. coli to make a whole bunch of tau. By expressing this um, this two PS from Gerbera hybrida, and, and it does it does express in, in E. coli, and it, you do make some tau. But we have good reason to believe um, that um, we could engineer two PS to enable higher titers in E. coli. Um, whether it's because it had it would have greater um, specificity towards malonyl CoA or higher expression, things like that. Um, so. 
we went out and we expressed libraries of 2PS in E. coli, along with our TAL responsive um, uh, ARC variant. And we used a LACZ reporter in this case. So we did basically blue white types of colony screens. Um, this is one of our initial works uh, in this area. And uh, just, you know, we did a couple of rounds and we, and we just showed that, that it works. If you find colonies that are, that are darker blue and you grow them up in liquid culture, they're making more towel, you know, almost, almost always, maybe not always, but almost always. Um, so, you know, run, one round of mutagenesis was random and we identified some kind of hot spots in the 2PS um, enzyme. And then we focused on those and did some saturation mutagenesis in the second round and, you know, boom, we made big improvements in, um, Intel production um, just by engineering that that enzyme. So it's a good demonstration of, of, of you know design the sensor, use the sensor, um, and you know uh, it, it's not necessarily as easy. It, it, it's just that because you design the sensor, but then you have to make the sensor have the right um, sensitivity in the screening system, maybe the right um, signal to noise ratio, dynamic range. All these things also matter. It depends on the per how much of, of the compound you're making. You know that you have to make match match the, the the dynamic range of the sensor with with the, what, what's actually happening in the cell. So there's some optimization, as like Jeff glossed over a thousand things. You know that are is really where the devil is in the details. How you make something actually work. Um, so here's a, just an example of improving the signal to noise ratio for colony screens by testing a bunch of different RBSs um, that are. Um, um, controlling the, the uh, or that controlling the tra translation initiation rate for the reporter gene, testing multiple copies versus single copy, you know, and just by doing that, you can we get this, you know, pretty drastic improvement in the signal to noise before we even start screening. So, just you know, everyone has to do optimization when they're developing a high throughput screen. This is an example of doing that um, uh, here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's just giving you some ideas of, of, of our kind of workflow. Um, another example here is biosynthesis of, of salicylic acid production uh, or in, in improving biosynthesis of salicylic acid um, using, a, using an SA, well, SA salicylic acid sensor. Um, so uh, previous work by um, Yajun Yan at University of Georgia, um, he basically um, established a metabolic pathway slash strain design in E. coli uh, for, for overproducing salicylic acid, but nothing was really yet optimized. Um, just establishing the, you know, the genes and, and demonstrating the functional expression, stuff like that. So my student, um, Shui, went in um, and sought to basically optimize this pathway to see if they could further uh, enhance the tail titer production. Uh, so we first demonstrated that with the cell sensor, you only get fluorescence, you know, in the presence of the actual product. So if you remove one or two of the upstream genes, the intermediates are not in, it activating the, um, the sensor um, slash report specific to cell or to uh, salicylic acid. Um, and then he went through and he basically made libraries of, again, ribosome binding site sequences designed using the RBS calculator as a, as a tool for like a range of, you know, one through six, low to high for, for all of six genes and made a combinatorial, you know, library then. It's about 39,000 different combinations in screen. Um, and just by doing that, you know, I mean, it's not easy, but, but eventually implementing all that, we was able to get, a, you know, pretty drastic improvements in, um, in better. Basically, it's by optimizing the relative expression levels of all these genes in the pathway. <clears throat> okay. Um, almost done. So sensor, uh, this is, um, I guess, a brief example of, of a more complicated protein engineering project. So I, I mentioned we, you know, had interest in, in, a, in a TAL sensor with this minimal, you know, polyketide synthase called 2PS. Um, so Take it if you do one more, um, uh, I guess, one more round of chain elongation, add on one more, uh, you know, Claisen condensation step with, with malonyl CoA, you get a tetraketide instead and you make orthosalinic acid. This, this, this is another type three polyketide synthase, orsinol synthase. 
So there is, um, for various reasons, this interest in altering the product specificity of these like, kind of very basic polyketide synthases um, to understand how they're doing gatekeeping um, of, of, of chain elongation. And there's interest in basically just making these compounds, like making more ursulinic acid for potential um, potential um, compound for um, pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> so RT, um, we collaborated with um, Costas Moranis uh, at Penn State. He, he's someone I've collaborated with quite a bit for, for many, many years. Um, and so this was a largely a computational design project, but it involves iter back and forth, I guess, some computational design and some directed evolution, random immunogenesis type things. And just want to show you, we went from a tail responsive variant of ARIS-C uh, to essentially switching it to a orsulinic acid um, specific variant through multiple steps. And you can see here, ultimately, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. I think like 12 total amino acid substitutions relative to the wild type. So it's like, you know, we're, it is some like very different, um, different proteins. Essentially, I will say we've done a little bit of structure. Uh, we, we solved the structure for, uh, I think this guy with five mutations or five active site changes. And, and there was no structure, no significant structural difference between that and wild. Type. So who knows how much is actually changing um, besides just you know, the, the uh, subtle, you know, molecular recognition and then that whole arm switching thing that ARC does. And finally, um, we, in, in recent work, work in my lab, we're, we have, we've been working on um, anaerobic alkane activation um, by expressing uh, a fumarate adding enzyme called an alkyl succinate synthase shown here. So it basically adds literally fumarate to an alkane to make an alkyl succinate, and that can be further metabolized. And so the idea is to convert alkanes into other things. Um, but the, the longer term holy grail is to convert that to a uh, methyl succinate. So we can activate methane, right? That's like the holy grail of all holy grails. Um, so, you know, we'd like to engineer the substrate specificity of this enzyme to, to act on methane to make methyl succinate um, and then continue in metabolism from there. So we recently, or we, we, we learned of a um, ITCR, this repressor from uh, Yersinia that um, is a lysar type regulator and, but it's induced by itaconic acid. Okay, so itaconic acid is the same as methylene succinate got this double bond here. Methyl succinate has this um, just a single bond. So that's the only difference between them, but doesn't respond to methyl succinate. So our goal was to engineer ITCR to respond to methyl succinate. So we've been doing that uh, with one of my new grad students, Asan. Um, you know, this is really interesting in the sense that the only difference between these two is, is, is a single carbon-carbon bond. Of course, that changes the, um, the stereochemistry quite a bit, but um, the um, it's still interesting, I guess, that you can get such drastic changes in in molecular recognition and, and subsequent gene expression. So we have here's wild type responding to methyl succinate, and here is wild type responding to itaconate, and now you see we have variants that basically behave like wild type towards methyl succinate. So that's where we are now. It's a couple of rounds of directed evolution. All right, I think I'm pretty good. Maybe. I'm done though. So thank you uh, for everyone who's who is interested and was paying attention. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge all, a lot of these people. You know, this is not the entirety of people that have been in and out of my lab. But these are those that did the most work on all the kind of transcription factor stuff and collaborators and some funding. Okay. <laughs> I see some chats. Yes, we have some chat questions. Um, Kevin, did you want to ask your question or should I read it out? Okay, I, I just want to ask that is the, you, you designed the ARAC protein for maybe sensing different kinds of metabolites. I'm, I'm just wondering that is this protein, that the change of structure is reversible if the metabolite is removed? 
Um, yes. Well, I mean, at least we know that for sure for wild type. Uh, for our variants, we, you know, we've like I said, we've done, we did a little bit of structural analysis so far to, that convinced us that basically we solved the, the crystal structure of, of one that had five mutations, five, five amino acid substitutions, and it looked the same um, as wild type, essentially, you know, very, very small changes. Um, and we've done some other studies, like if, we, if you take away, you know, it, it forms that loop. Um, I should just... Eris C does this looping. Oh my God, what am I doing? Does this looping deal? So there is a, a half site up here that that the that the um, uninduced, you know, uh, apo form, I guess, um, contacts. And we've done studies where we remove that um, to show that with our mutants, they're still contacting that um, in the absence of inducer. So, you know, we, we feel like the, the variants that we're making still basically act in the same way. They're, they're often almost always much weakier. So, it, it, meaning they probably don't contact this site um, with the same affinity, which is probably because we, the arm is now um, maybe more likely to, to be in this closed position whoops, uh, because of mutations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's complicated. You have to basically have this, this energetic balance with the arm preferring to contact a DNA binding domain versus closing the loop and stuff like that. But we, we generally believe that our mutants, in spite of their being leakier, typically, um, behave the same way. Meaning when there's no ligand, they loop the DNA. When there is ligand, they, they you know, and, and when the ligand leaves, they go back to, yeah. So the flipping should be back and forth. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. And Dr. Tabor had a question. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, well, I kind of said, we've been trying to do some of this computational design quite a bit and, it, and it's hard because it's mm -hmm. not as simple as ligand binding. Um, you can have a really, really good type binding uh, inducer, but it won't be an inducer. It'll be uh, an inhibitor. Um, mm -hmm. it, it'll it'll bind tightly and not allow for the arm to close and cause conformational change and all that. So in fact, like, you know, what, one of the first things that they learned with air with ARC was fucose, which is, looks a lot like arabinose, but it has just like different orient, you know, the anomeric positions are different or something. It's an inhibitor, it prevents the activation. So you can design for tight binding, but that's not all you, that's not exactly what you want. You, you, and that's where it gets more complicated because of this conformational change that is involved. So we try, you know, as I mentioned with Moranis, we, we, we do the bind, the, the, you know, energy calculations and look for the great binders and look for the intermediate binders. And um, sometimes the computational work is helpful and a lot of times it's not, I don't know, I, but you know, sometimes it is. Did that kind of answer your question? <laughs> Is Jeff even still here? And David? Yes, uh, I wanted to ask about specificity. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, uh, like a decoy to prevent the original arabinose. Yeah. But I was just wondering if, if like structurally related um, inducers could also. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we always look, we don't always look for that. I mean, I mean, I get, we, we could argue that we don't care if something else doesn't, would never be present for the application of interest, even if it's similar, but we typically look. So, you know, I think, um, uh, how do I get out of here? And, uh, 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 not my Oh, there. Oh, boy. Oops. All right. Do you see that? Yep. You know, we've done this kind of study, this kind of analysis where we look at different. Um, this is showing induced more than twofold induced in the presence of different constant. And I uh, the concentrations reported here. I, I threw this in because this is like in the subgrade material of a paper that we published, and uh, we must 
I don't even know where we were, where the concentrations are. But, you, but yeah, we all we do test the, the promiscuity uh, quite often. Um, you know, I, I think uh, another example. I have a lot of examples, but I didn't I didn't show them here. We typically, um, I guess it varies, but sometimes we have really, really high, highly specific um, uh, sensors and, and sometimes we don't, I guess is what I'll say um, without pulling up a bunch of, you know, trying to find a bunch of other data. But, you know, the one thing that I presented with um, the orsolinic, or no, I'm sorry, the salicylic acid sensor here was showing that at least, you know, what we really cared about was that we wouldn't get a response from this or this, or, you know, or even, you know, or other upstream compounds. And so we, you know, at least ver verified that, that there was, I don't have the, the previous slide to this work that showed that he tested also a bunch of the aromatic amino acid pathway. It looked like he probably tested stichemic acid and um, um, here, these guys, chorismic acid, stichemic acid, he tested those guys, you know, and none of them induced it. And then he, and then, we didn't have access to these compounds, so instead we um, just did the metabolic tests. And I, I think it's, it's what happened. So I think that's how we did it. <clears throat> I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Anybody I else? A, yeah. I had a question. Um, so you said that when you were engineering for improved tal production, um, you had reasons to think that there was room for improvement. Like how, yeah. how did you know that you could make it better? Yeah, well, I mean, we didn't, but we when we expressed the enzyme, and, and this was a while ago, but um, I think partly because it was a, a plant-based enzyme and, and it's I think it had already, or, or we characterized it's it's K, uh, KM for malonyl CoA, and it was um, a lot higher than the typical concentration of malonyl CoA and E. coli when it's growing on glycerol, which I think is what we use, which is the best one to use to get malonyl CoA up high enough. Uh, um, so we we reasoned that there were there were ways of potentially changing KCAT or KM. Uh, whether it's for malonyl CoA or for the, uh, you know, for the substrates, because um, there's, you know, you get multiple, there's multiple steps here. Oops. Ay, ay, ay. You get um, two of these and then another, and then another um, malonyl CoA after you get the, the, so we, you know, it was kind of, we weren't sure it could be an expression mutant. We, I, I can't remember if we, I'm pretty, I'm all positive we first did um, codon optimization of the 2PS. But it doesn't, that still doesn't mean you're gonna have the optimal expression. You know, you could still, mm -hmm. you could still improve expression. So mm -hmm. um, we had reasonably, I, partly also maybe because it was just really low, <laughs> the, the tighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so we were, and something else that I didn't present here was we also did uh, a genomic library screen so we, we did in fact i think i have it can you see this yes okay so we also made a t partial digestion of the e coli um genome cloned all that into plasmids with, with, with different size fragments with and without a promoter to turn on whatever the whatever genes were thrown in there and we screened that as well so for like more strain engineering mm -hmm. and that we also were able to get about a 50 percent improvement and it, you know it was interesting because we, we found a bunch of non-intuitive um on you know genes that were hard to explain why their overexpression conferred higher tal production so mm -hmm. we, we did both you know strain engineering and mm -hmm. enzyme engineering yeah and when you're um making these kind of optimized sensors, um, how does the numbers game work of like, what with what frequency do you get something that completely loses specificity? And with what frequency do you get something that changes specificity? And I know, of course, it would depend on the library. Yeah, it depends on the libraries. And 
you know, there's, there's, I'll say that one thing, like if we go to that workflow, once we got this kind of going, we tested a lot of compounds on, on you know, first on plates. Um, maybe half of the compounds like were leads or, or less than half, you know, probably. Meaning the other ones, we just couldn't get any any response. Mm -hmm. It was all just leaky, mm -hmm. non, you know, non-specific. Everything went away maybe when, when you do the mm -hmm. negative sort or, or when you do the positive. So that was part of it is many of the compounds that we tested just got nothing. Um, and then how specific were a lot of them? You know, the whole point is, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time figuring out where we were losing candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, if they didn't come out during the next, if, if we if we couldn't get things to come out of the sorts, then it was just mm -hmm. gone. So it's hard to know like well how many of those would have been good, but they but the decoy that we chose was one that they also responded to. So so they got sorted away in the negative, you know, in the negative sort with the decoy. You know, maybe they were super, super uh, specific except for the compound of interest and the one decoy but we <laughs> lost it because we threw the decoy in you know I mean so it, it we it's hard to go back and like really do an exhaustive you know quantitative mm -hmm. you know um, you know analysis of percentage that responded to this but these other things we really just picked what came out of the out of the whole mm -hmm. uh, workflow mm -hmm. and those I showed that one table with all the different check marks and, you know, it's published. You, you could, you, you know, you could go to these papers if you really yeah, want to know. Uh, <laughs> some of them are very sensitive or specific and some of them are not, you know. <laughs> so. All right. Um, Any other questions out there? David, uh, no one? I have a question uh, quickly. So I, I, I just thought it was interesting you're doing all your positive selection steps on plates and your negative uh, through facts. So uh, why is that? Um, we, so we definitely, yeah, the negative on facts is, this was like always the, the super duper key is this first massive round of negative. Um, we don't always go straight to a positive selection, but um, I don't know, over the years, like my students have tended to, to really prefer selections whenever possible over, over, over facts, but, but, you know, it, it, it's also a matter of preference to some extent in what you're, what you're good at and how, how, what kind of instrument you're using and how good you are with the instrument. Um, we had our own instrument in our lab for a while and it was very troublesome and students hated, you hated working with it. Um, now we're, you know, using, uh, the, 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 the core at, um, Baylor and it's like so great because I'll, we don't have to do anything and they're awesome it just costs us money but it's great you know so there's, there's a more of a preference just to use the facts again but um, you know we just had a period where where we really we found that selections were very effective uh, at, at least initial rounds of screening um, kind of like wiping everything out that wasn't going to show up um, but and, and we talk about it in this paper that, you know, that, that's, that's cited here, um, you know, why that wasn't sufficient. You still had to go back and do, you know, decoy screening. In fact, was, was, was great for doing the decoy screening. And then in, in increasing the stringency by, by lowering the concentration of the compound in subsequent rounds of facts. Uh, maybe also because there was just like laziness and having to reclone over and over again. Like you had a subclone each step every time, you know, you, it just becomes too intractable so that's just like just do it once and at the beginning and once at the end you know it's kind of it was like you know this is how sorting always is how many rounds are you gonna do well I don't know. the theory says i should do this many but but if i do more we get better results so you know let's do more so unfortunately i don't have a very good answer you know it, it's it's a little bit of hand waving and it, it's the balance of cloning and um use which instrument you're using at the time and stuff like that yep Practicality. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool yeah. work. Thanks. All right. Good. Thanks to both of our speakers very much. Those were two really interesting talks. And I hope to see everybody next month for our March micro talk. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you. Take care.
Bye. Bye, everybody. Very good.